This is a recording on what are known as response surface methods or simply RSM and prior to watching the video you should read the instructor notes on response surface methods. Okay. And I want to begin by discussing uh, George Box, as most people just called him George, and he's an interesting person in the history of statistics and actually in engineering. And Box was a chemist and chemical engineer. And during World War II, he conducted experiments for the British Army. It actually turned out to be on chemical warfare. But he learned about experiments by reading R.A. Fisher's book and became intrigued with the whole idea of statistics. And after the war, he got a PhD from Cambridge. And then something important happened. He decided to go to work as a statistician and engineer for the, Imper Imper yeah, it's the Imperial Chemical Company in England. And his experiences working there as an engineer would revolutionize the way we think about designing experiments and analyzing them. In fact, Box's job was characterization and optimization of chemical processes. And he quickly realized that the traditional designs of Ira Fisher were really useful for what we might call explanatory modeling for understanding what factors might be important. And again, most of Fisher's work was in agriculture. Well, Box needed designs and models that could predict performance. And we've had some exposure to prediction when we studied screening designs. But Box is really the first one to recognize this as an important part of experimental design. And he, as a result, developed new sets of models and prediction methods. Now, he was aware of two-level designs. They did exist. But in most physical systems, especially chemical systems, one is always going to find some nonlinear behavior. Therefore, he wanted designs that would allow him to estimate main effects, second order effects, and potentially quadratic effects. So Box decided that in terms of optimization and characterization, the full quadratic model would be his base model uh, for these tasks. And the model contains all main effects, all quadratic effects, and all possible two-way interactions. Essentially, what Box is saying is a second order approximation to the behavior of the system is sufficient for optimization and characterization. And in general, he's correct. However, these full quadratic models, as I point out uh, towards the bottom of the slide, let me grab a pointer option, can require a lot of terms. So the total number of terms in a full quadratic model is given by the following formula. And as an example, if k were 6, 6 factors, the model has 28 terms. As a result, in terms of estimation, one would need a rather large model and a rather large design to support that model. Okay. So in order to fit these models, Box had to come up with, as I said, new designs. Now, at his era, the what we call 3 to the k factorials, that's k factors each at three levels, existed. But he realized these designs are very inefficient in terms of number of runs, and therefore not even economically feasible in most cases. So Box created a couple of experimental designs purely for fitting quadratic models. One is known as the central composite design, and the other the Box Benkin. And my focus is more on the central composite design which actually is still widely used, as are Box Bankins. But the central composite is actually a really nice and very flexible design to use in practice. 
and I'm going to skip through some of the slides okay and move forward to slide 16 to talk more about what we call central composite designs they are comprised of two portions usually there's a factorial portion that's usually a 2 to the K or 2 to the K minus P fraction and then an additional set of runs that box called axial points and these runs are there to fit second order terms that's their only purpose so typically one first runs the factorial portion with center points this lets you estimate um, main effects in two-way interactions and the center points less lets you test for curvature if you find curvature then you can go ahead and fit the axial points because that indicates you need quadratic terms in the model. If no curvature is found, then one can just drop the axial portion. Again, the axial portion is only used to fit quadratic terms. So if there's no curvature, the points are unnecessary. And on slide 17 is an example of what a CCD looks like. So when you see the corner points, basically these are your standard factorial points. The design requires at least one center point. And then notice that the axial points are right on the coordinate axes that define the system, hence the term axial points. And again, in terms of fitting squared terms, these axial points are positioned to fit quadratic terms and that is their only purpose. Okay, so on slide 18 is a picture of a three-factor central composite design and notice there are six axial points setting on the three axes and these have been set at 1.68. Uh, there is no set rule as to how far the axial points have to be from the center and quite often they're set for um, simplicity at the square root of the number of factors okay. or they're simply set at plus or minus one because the experimental region cannot be stretched any further. Okay. And on slide 19 is a easy to see example this is a two-factor CCD and by the way notice from the center to any corner point is the square root of 2 so all of the points the axial and the factorial points lie on a circle they're all at a radius square root of 2 and basically in general if you put them the axial points at the square root of K this gives you all your points on a sphere and in general this is actually gives you fairly nice in fact nice properties for a central composite okay so let's take a look at an example this is a central composite design where we're looking at uh, yield of a chemical reaction we're only looking at uh, two processes time and temperature notice they have axial points and there are a set of center points so at this point what we're going to do is go to jump and do an analysis of a central composite this is a similar design and again this is looking at reaction yield so I would go to fit model highlight time and temp in the select columns window under macros select response surface and select yield as the response okay so we run the model okay. and notice that um, actually all the quadratic terms in the interaction appear significant and a couple of things that are useful under the main report menu and under factor profiling which means visuals 
is a contour profiler. That's a top-down view of the response surface. Okay. And sometimes people like to look at three-dimensional plots. And by the way, in the Contour Profiler, in the Report menu for the Contour Profiler, you can add a grid by selecting Contour Grid. Okay. And from that, you can see this is a roughly symmetric response surface. And the optimum yield is somewhere right near the center of the surface. Of course, we can still use desirability functions. Okay. And we want to maximize yield. So maximize and remember. Okay. And indeed, you can see close to the center of the region is where we're getting our maximum yield. And then the 3D view, I think, is nice if you're trying to study the surface in some detail. But from this, you can see, indeed, the response surface is more or less mound-shaped and symmetric with a nice maximum setting in the middle. So if you wanted to optimize yield for this process, you'd run at the recommended settings of time and temperature. Okay. And we'll do some further analysis of some other types of response surface designs. I'm going to show one other example. And this one doesn't actually have a true maximum. But this is a, another central composite in four factors. And this one is a process that converts a monomer to a polymer. And the response, once again, is yield. So again, notice the size of the design. This is uh, 26 runs. Okay, so it's a fairly large design. And probably I would even add more center points to it. So we'll go to Analyze, Fit Model. So I'm going to highlight A, B, C, and D. Under Macros, once again, Response Surface. That gives us the full quadratic model to estimate. Yield is the response. And run the model. And again, we can do things like, under Profiling, we can look at the Contour Profiler. Okay. And we can take a look at the Surface Profiler. Of course, with four inputs, we can only look at slices through the region. Now, we could go through and do some simplification of the model. But at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and once again show desirability. We want to maximize yield. Okay. Okay. And notice in this case that for two of the variables, B and C, we have hit um, at the boundary of the experimental region. That's where the maximum is found. So we might do better if we extended the regions for B and C. And what's really going on, I want to illustrate, there actually is no true maximum. I'm going to highlight for you B and C. Notice when we look at B and C, if you look at the response surface, it's sort of saddle shaped. That's very common in response surface analysis. So at least in the B and C uh, slices through the system, there's no um, actual maximum. All we can say is, because of the saddle system, if we go in certain directions, the response goes up. And let me do this okay. with the 3D profiler. This is probably easier for you to see at the bottom. So in this case, again, there is no absolute. We can see, actually, it's hard for me to locate it, but you can see that there is one region in B and C, right at the boundary of the experimental region, is where the maximum is found. 
and that is because we do not have this nice mound shaped surface we have a saddle and we using desirability what it tells us is where we can find the maximum and now it's giving some ideas in B and C where we might move to get even higher yield and given we're only at roughly 72.5% uh, usually in uh, chemical engineering you're looking for better yield than that if at all possible.